Hey guys, Max here. This is your daily market update for yesterday, which was Christmas Day and actually the day before as well because we missed that day out. Obviously, markets were closed. It's a holiday in most countries and the news cycle was quite tame and slow as well. So it's probably going to be a little bit of a shorter video today, but there are still a few things to talk about, namely Omicron and the virus, why there's been so much volatility in the markets recently, and then a couple developments in China. So let's get right into it. So of course, markets have struggled for the entire month with huge volatility started off with the early identification and the spread of the Omicron variant and the huge amount of fears around how bad it could be. You know, people were thinking early on in the month that it could be more deadly than Delta, more transmissible than Delta and be resistant to vaccines as well. Obviously, we know that's not the case now, but that caused a lot of volatility early on in the month. We saw oil prices crater, like literally drop 20, 30% overnight and stocks crash a few times as well as news came out suggesting that the variant was so bad that restrictions all over the world would come back into force. We'd see lockdowns again, full on lockdowns as well. And that would obviously be really bad for the economy and really bad for the markets as well. Then we got more inflation data. First, we got the CPI figures for the US, then the PCE figures, and it was bad in both in the US. But everyone expected it to be bad, to be honest. So markets mostly just shrugged that inflation data off, as they have done for the last few months. We also got data from other places like the UK and Europe, and it was actually for the most part worse than we expected, which did shake the markets a little bit and sort of kicked some central banks up a gear. We had news come out from the Fed and other central banks as well that in short, they were going to fight inflation now. They were going to reduce their asset purchases and start raising interest rates. Of course, markets again had a bit of a wobble with loads of volatility on this news as they feared an overly hawkish Fed that would crash the economy by caring too much about inflation as they see it and not prioritizing asset prices as they have done over the last year. We did see some other central banks other than the Fed, of course, take some real action with the Bank of England actually raising interest rates immediately instead of just promising to do it six months into the future. Now, at first, markets were worried about the hawkish Fed and their supposed change of heart regarding inflation and interest rates and everything. But after a couple of days, they priced in the likelihood that the Fed is all bark and no bite and that their plans are still so ridiculously dovish that it seems clear that the Fed is happy to let inflation stay high because they just want to keep asset prices high as well. It's common knowledge at this point, but the Fed have been doctoring the inflation data for decades now, and they do it because they want higher inflation, but the people who suffer under that inflation, the voters, obviously don't want it. Now, the fears that Fed asset purchases would stop earlier, again, caused a little taper tantrum at the time, but in the end, the markets are mostly ignoring that for now and just pushing the problem later on. And I've seen some people ask why the markets rebounded, and it's very, very simple. Over the last month, the Fed has bought another $150 billion worth of assets. Just because they are tapering or planning on tapering in the future, just because their purchases will be decreasing in the future, it doesn't mean that they're not still inflating asset prices today. They are still inflating asset prices, flooding the market with capital with these asset purchases. Now, during all of this volatility, the main headache was really uncertainty. No one really knew and still no one really knows what's actually going to come in the future. And while that is always the case, it's a little bit less certain than usual today. That makes it very hard to price assets accordingly to know what you want to invest in, where you want your capital to sit and where you don't want it to sit if you just don't know what's going to happen in the future. When we get headlines saying that Omicron will kill us all and markets panic a little bit, then we get another headline saying that the virus is less deadly than we thought, not more, and so they recover a little bit. The truth is, investors are trying to squeeze out every penny of this bull market, they are trying to ride it up right up until the last second, and they're keeping all of their capital in the markets right now because there are no alternatives. Fixed income assets are so bad and inflation is so high, where else are you going to put your money? We have seen the crypto markets roughly mirror equity markets as well, albeit with far higher volatility. And to me, they've proven themselves to be risk on assets over the last month. They behave just like any other risk on assets. There's been this narrative being pushed that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are an inflation hedge. And while some people do use it as an inflation hedge, some very intelligent and successful investors like Paul Tudor Jones, well, it isn't behaving like one yet. 
Now, look, I see the argument for it that it's either deflationary or disinflationary. It has the max supply of 21 million coins and the amount it's going to be increasing by is going to decrease. So that's the disinflation part in the future. But the thing is, an inflation hedge should not lose 30% of its value within three weeks as inflation is higher than it's ever been before. And if your inflation hedge does lose 30% of your value, then it's simply not a good inflation hedge. Equally, if it rises by 30% over the course of a week, then it's not a good inflation hedge because the aim of an inflation hedge is not to speculate and make yourself a billionaire, it's to hedge against inflation. Sorry to annoy some of the Bitcoin maxis out there, but you just need to hear it sometimes. Now, what do I see happening in the near term future? Well, I see inflation staying high reach in 7% according to the CPI and probably even going a little bit higher and the real figures will probably be touching 11 or 12%. I see the Fed continuing with their pace of tapering but maybe midway through 2022 when the inflation situation hasn't improved at all, I think they might increase the rate of interest rate hikes as they realise they actually do need to fight inflation. Now when this happens, risk sentiment in the markets probably deteriorates as it becomes clear the party is over, there's no more profits to be had and we probably enter a bear market. Now why do I not think a bear market is coming tomorrow? Well it might, again I can't predict the future as I said earlier but investors are trying to squeeze every single penny out of this market and so they're going to stay invested for as long as possible. Where else are they supposed to put their cash? In bonds and get negative 6% returns a year? In real estate where prices have inflated 30% over the last year alone? Or in cash where inflation will destroy any chance of coming out on top? The greed of billion dollar institutions knows no bounds and they'll probably push this for as long as physically possible. But the trigger for the crash that will come, the most likely reason for it to all fall down, will almost certainly be the Fed and their actions. Now, for the updates on everything else, apart from the markets, what's been going on? Well, Omicron is spreading and it's in every country and it's causing case numbers to rise in pretty much every country as well. Even countries which have prioritised zero COVID policies like New Zealand and Australia, well, they're getting loads of cases as well and they're kind of on the back foot here. Restrictions have been put in place to try and reduce this spread in loads of countries as well, mainly in Europe though, where fear of COVID has always been far higher than in other countries like the US. Some authorities have just shut down Christmas. Most have just tried to convince people not to go see their families and not to hug their families and things like that. China is seeing loads of Omicron cases as well and they're putting in full-on lockdowns again. A city called Xi'an, a 13 million people city, is in 100% military enforced lockdown. If you go out without a pass, you go straight to an internment camp. You're never seen again by a family, that kind of thing. And this is awful for China and their already collapsing economy. It turns out that the vaccine they mostly use, the Sinovac one, well, it just doesn't work against the Omicron variant, even with a third jab. So the country is in for a tough time in the future. I guess this is also a warning to countries like Serbia, who prioritized any vaccines over good ones. Made in China comes with a big caveat, as we all know too well. We can probably expect this general trend of cases rising due to Omicron to continue for a bit, but deaths are staying very low, so most governments are trying to avoid lockdowns again, though some of the more authoritarian governments around the world right now are probably going to revert to the lockdowns of yore. Now in China particular news, we have seen that they have replaced their Communist Party chief, the guy who was basically the Chinese version of Adolf Eichmann, the architect of the Holocaust, well, he's been replaced by someone else and his tenure has all been about oppression in the west of the country, targeting Ouija Muslims in particular. Now, this could be a sign that the CCP is aware of how awful their optics are and how every other liberal government in the world has awoken to the threat that they pose. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is sort of an attempted rebrand by the CCP, a start over. And let's just ensure that if that is the case, that it fails. Now, China's central bank is also trying to stimulate their flailing economy, claiming that they will keep credit markets secure and protect the real economy. This is the best example of just spouting buzzwords I've seen in a while. None of this really means anything until we find out what their actual policies will be. A central bank can claim everything in the world, but their ability to deliver is far, far rarer. Now, that is it for the day. It is Boxing Day. I hope you all had a great holiday. I know I did. Saw some family, ate some food, drank some beer. We're going to go back to our daily upload schedule as well. I've really enjoyed making these videos this last month and the response from you all has been huge and it's really great to see. So I'm going to keep doing them, of course. 
If you enjoyed this video, then leave a like and a comment to bless the YouTube algorithm. If you want more content like this, then check out our Patreon and join our community of investors. You get access to our Discord, loads of exclusive content like insight into my portfolio and buy and sell alerts for my own personal investments. And if you join before December ends, then the next month will be entirely free, but this offer only stands for a few more days. There's a link in the description to masterworks.io, a site that allows you to buy fractional shares of art from world famous artists like Banksy, which can be a great way to diversify your portfolio with non-market correlated assets. It's completely free to sign up. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to hand over any card information. So if that sounds interesting, then make sure to check that out. There's also a link in the description to BlockFi, which will give you up to $250 in free Bitcoin when you use it. You can also get 9% interest on stable coins like USDC, which is a far higher rate than you'll get from any savings account these days. Just make sure not to use Tether. Thank you all for the support. Thanks for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.